I think the way we think about it is that it's good to be aware of the macro, uh, but yet at the same time, uh, don't let it affect. So do you want to give an example, right? Yeah. We I tend to look at tailwinds and tailwinds that are teams that are going to be multi-decades. So I'll give you some example of tailwinds, right? One, one tailwind that I shared with you was the electronification of payments, right? That is a tailwind that is probably going to take place in decades, right? Yes, you might have the Fed affecting it in one day. In one any one given year, you might have lower, lesser consumption, you might have lesser of debt. But as long as the tailwind, which is basically the war on cash, as more cash shifts to more electronic payments, um, certain companies will tend to benefit from that over the longer term. Now, they might be softer over one or two years, but overall, the longer term, it will generally still benefit. So what we're trying to do is find companies that tend to ride this kind of tailwinds and not we, we, we have this, right? And also, we generally tend to avoid a lot of cyclical companies. So we, I, we, barely, we have barely any cyclical com companies in the portfolio that tends to write, oh, uh, that, that basically follows, follows market cycles. I think that's really um, the way how I think about it, right? So removing that cyclicality a bit, a bit apart. Um, now, going back to interest rates, interest rates is, is a very interesting bit because this is a bit counterintuitive. I'm going to try to share it, right? So when people really think about that, when interest rates go up, what it, what it typically means is that you're discounting rates of your cash flows because all of us tend to have two discounted cash flow models. Mm. Also goes discounting rate goes up. So when the discounting rate goes up, which means the present value drops, right? For the same amount of future value of cash flows, when the discounting rate goes up, the, the present value drops. Which means ideally the stock price should drop, right? Because if the business doesn't change, ceteris paribus, higher discounting rate, the, 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 the present value should drop. Mm. But a very interesting bit is that people don't realize is that the discounting rate is typically made out of two things. One, there's a cost of equity and there's a cost of debt. Now the cost of debt. Let's talk about the cost of debt first, which is easier because the cost of debt is just the cost of your interest rates, right? If you're borrowing debt. Now, for our portfolio, uh, with the portfolio has to be net debt, a uh, net net cash. So we have actually very only very little debt, right? Yeah. So the cost of debt actually doesn't really affect us from our standpoint. And also, higher interest rates do not increase the borrowing cost of all companies uniformly because if you have raised a bond two years ago at low interest rates, you're still paying that low interest rate. You're not paying any high interest rates. So the increase of interest, interest rates, right, only affect the marginal debt that you're going to raise. Is the marginal, not the entire portfolio of all the debt. So the, a, a company's borrowing cost doesn't increase. Now two, you go back to the cost of equity, right? Cost of equity is typically made out of two things. One, you have the risk-free rate, which is in this case, the, the Fed rate, or in this case, most people use the 10-year US Treasury rate, which is the, the, the government bond rate, right? Uh, so that, that's the U that they use. That goes up and down following the Fed. And they have what we call an equity risk premium. The equity risk premium, interestingly, is always a very strong offset to that risk-free rate. So now what happens is that we have seen, we've seen the 10-year gone up high. The equity risk premium actually dropped. And actually, if you look at the last 10 years, the cost of equity has actually been, has actually come down over the last 40, 50 years and actually actually been ranged down. Even though, even though interest rates have gone up. So for us as investors, right? For example, I'm really typically using a 10, 8 to 10 percent cost of equity. To me, if if you're investing in a company and if your cost of equity goes from 8 to 10 percent and it tells you that you should sell the company, um, I mean you're playing in a very different game than, than we do. Like, we're not doing that at all because you know our companies are growing, the our portfolio with the average growth rate is north of 25 percent, right? 30 percent actually. So if you're affected by one to two percent changes in the in the discount rates and, and you have to sell the entire portfolio, something is very wrong from our, from our standpoint, um, from, from the aspect. And to be honest, we tend to use what we call uh, more normalized market multiples as well. Mm. So I, I'm using this market multiples, which are again what is so to give an example, right? It cannot be because interest rates go up and down cyclically, uh, right? We don't in our discounted cash flows have an interest rate that goes up and down. We have an interest rate model that goes flat. So right now, if interest rates is at all-time high, you cannot be throughout your entire history when you know that interest rate has gone through up and down, still price flat, right? Which is which is just madness from the standpoint. So I, I see a fundamental flaw in the way most people do these counter cash flow models, which is just wrong in my in my opinion. Uh, like at the top, they're just using one straight line and one same rate. And obviously, you are you are obviously going to artificially depress it because in two years' time, an interest rate for I don't know, right? Are you, you have not assumed that and not pricing in your model, right? You should, ideally, if you use a more market normalized interest rate, you shouldn't really affect that at all.